Ah, hey guys, welcome to my first review. I've reviewed one of the first PC strategy games I remember playing, and a game I have a lot of memories on, Airport Battle for Doom, released by Westwood in 2001, shortly after Red Alert 2, and published by EA. I have played a lot of strategy games, and as far as old, simple strategy games go, a lot of people can say Westwood set the bar for those types of games, and a lot of PC gamers have memories of that least Command and Conquer before he created... Uh, yeah... But there is much more to learn about the Baron Spice Planet. This game still holds up pretty well today. There's a lot of old design choices and interesting relics from RTS Pass, but as limited as games set within the Dune universe are, this probably is one of the best ones. Good if you're either a Dune fan who doesn't care about extended universe lore and, you know, lore of loyalty, or if you like RTS, like Command and Conquer. And there are three campaigns for the three factions in the game, each with unique missions and story, and even the old funny live action cutscenes Westwood was, uh, Famous for. What? I am Jermaine here on KD Prime? Draining the Baron's pustules? Wiping the spittle from his innumerable chin? Study your charm film book, brother! You insolent! Unfortunately, this game has never been formally released on any online platform like Steam or even EA Origin for some awful reason. I still have my copy from the early 2000s, but as far as playing it, you're shit out of luck. Unless you want to resort to more. Uh, on ethical means. Which is even more of a shame, as this game still runs impressively well on my modern machine, just some weird flickers or effects here and there, and being locked on a low resolution. But if you do manage to track a copy down, and don't have a CD key, don't worry, because this game exists in a time where you can either enter all zeros or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. for the CD key, and it will allow you to play the game single player or in LAN, with the only drawback being no access to the non-existent online network mode which probably hasn't even worked since EA took Westwood and had them face the wall. There are three major factions in the game. The first two, of course, are the major Dune boys, the Atreides and the Arconan, the main protagonist and antagonist factions of Dune Media, each coming with a pretty neat intro sequence to their campaigns. House Harkonnen, from the volcanic wasteland of Gidi Prime. The Harkonnen know only malevolence, hatred, and brutality. House Atreides, of the waterworld Caladan. The Atreides army is well trained and loyal to the Duke Achilles. The Harkonnen are evil and the Atreides love the Duke. The third faction is the Ordos, who are pretty minor slash non-existent in the Dune universe, but are pretty cool nonetheless. The Ordos are mercenary. They care for nothing, save power and wealth. In the language of the Ordos, there are no words for the concepts of trust or honor. There are more than 300 for the concept of profit. Having 300 words for obtaining profit means these guys are also assholes, but more neutral. On top of the three primary factions, there are five sub-factions that can be played alongside your main faction. First are the Fremen, and as the loving Yannick Kobal says the Fremen are, uh... The desert people. We'll go with that. I like the Fremen. They have a cool attack sound. While the Fremen operate with stealth fields and snipers in-game with a niche of being able to control the sandworm with the Fetikin, there is also the Sardaukar, who are more rank-and-file, high-damage infantry. The Sardaukar simply have an elite and normal trooper, with the elite one getting a knife, but zombie fashion. Do people still like zombies? Well, there's also the Tylaxu, who are space zombies. They're not that good, I've never found a solid application with them, even as cannon father. They are of little use to us, but they can be very dangerous. However, if you're a supreme Korean transcendent APM god, you might be able to make use of the leeches, who turn vehicles into more leeches, while the zombies turn infantry. They're a fun and just slightly impractical faction. Or, you could play them if you just want to hear the funny zombie. <laughs> Yes. 
Construction started. Yes. Then there's the Its. Fascist technocrats is how to put them. They are strange, but slightly more viable than Talaxu. They have a unit who's a stealth kamikaze and a support vehicle that can create holographic images of player troops, which can be used to add HP dummies to the battlefield. Then there's the Spacing Guild, who have the Maker, a high damage slugman who shoots lightning, and the NIAB tank, which can teleport and do good damage. They are very expensive units to produce, but can make for some interesting strategy in adding AoE or bulking up an army composition. The guild essentially tax space travel and are giant slug douchebag aristocrats. The Spacing Guild is the only faction that cannot be allied with in the campaign for sub-factions, as they serve to be the antagonist in the final mission. Of course it would be a disservice to not talk about the major faction's strengths and weaknesses, so we will talk about my favorite most played faction, the Harkonnen. Remember, on the planet ZD Prime, you can only have three hair colors. Blonde, red, or bald. The Harkonnen seem to specialize in explosives. They have a destruction-oriented powerful roster ranging from long-range oil catapult vehicles to flamethrower troops that are close range but can take down a lot of infantry. I would say the Harkonnen are in the middle of the power scale compared to the other factions. If playing with super weapons on, the Death Hand is a nuke which does some AoE damage and some lingering DPS. It's good. Their power seems to mainly drive from knowing what their units are good against. Their infantry are diverse with lots of use of firing explosions. Each of their vehicles satisfy a niche as the buzzsaw being able to run over groups of infantry or even the devastator with special abilities to self-destruct. Unfortunately, the self-destruct is pretty bad and impractical, even if you get it off at a good time. The explosion doesn't do too much damage, and stopping the micro to double-click a robot that might die in the time span you even tried does not feel good at all. Which is a huge problem with a few main Ordos units as well. They're a fun, industrial kaboom race. People that like powerhouse races will like the Harkonnen. The barren spice must flow. This act of terrorism may prove useful, Commander. The Atreides are the Jack of all trades, master of none faction. They probably have the best unit roster in the game, but the worst super weapon, which simply makes all the enemy units leave the map. Typically though, if you're playing with friends, you'll probably have super weapons turned off due to the nature of the game. So this shortcoming isn't too big of a deal. Late game, they can pump out powerful units throughout all their main production buildings. They definitely have the most powerful vehicles with a sonic tank, which can decimate groups of units and infantry, and the Minotaur, which is tanky, slow, but has really good range and can destroy vehicles before they even have a chance, especially compared to the Harkonnen Devastator. And on top of that, they have access to the Repair Bot, which later amongst an army can provide healing for the high DPS vehicles. If the Atreides get going in a skirmish match, it's hard to stop them. Their Sonic Tank and Minotaurs alone can easily beat late game compositions of both factions. In comparison, a Minotaur spam can easily be a Devastator spam, outranging them before they even get close, and Minotaurs cost a whopping 450 space cash less than a Devastator. Their infantry has good range with the Snipers and the Kinjal units. The Kinjal require a setup and is a Mortar type unit, while the snipers can take out waves of basic infantry with ease. People who like balanced playstyles at good range on their units will enjoy the Atreides. Commander, you fight for all humanity. You will transport the data of the gas to the maintenance area. Finally, there's the Ordos, the most unique of the two. The Orders were essentially created by Westwood to shake up gameplay in the very first game, Dune 2, and they are a non-canon in Herbert's Dune universe. I like them personally, but unfortunately that their uniqueness is the root of their problems to how weak the faction feels. At face value, they seem like an okay specialist faction. They essentially have a flamethrower on a basic unit, and motors in their cover type and mortar infantry. However, plenty of units of theirs have problems in all stages of the game and it kind of forces them to be defensive in their playstyle due to having two types of mortars to set up, and the strength of their vehicles are simply that they are fast and good to scout with, but that doesn't fare well with this type of game at all. When the tug of war starts happening, it seems very difficult to get orders to win against any enemy player. They rely on very unorthodox win conditions. 
Sabotars slash I in the sky rushes to blow up their bases, deviators to change the alignment of enemy vehicles, just all around weird but interesting mechanics that unfortunately don't work as they should because it might be too powerful. However, in their specialist nature, their super weapon Chaos Lightning is pretty good compared to the others as it makes everyone go berserk and start shooting at everything so it could be effective at doing damage to bases and breaking up turtles. Overall, they are fun and their campaign is enjoyable, but if you're trying to play good, they might not be the best choice. People who like unorthodox factions like Skrin and Command and Conquer 3 should play the Ordos. All the major races and sub-races differ from each other enough for you to get a lot of enjoyment on playing all of them. Even the ones that I consider not that good can still be very enjoyable to play and make work. Emperor Balfour Dune is a simple grandfather RTS. If you have experience with RTS, there really isn't much to learn. The tech tree is simple for each race, you just kinda need to know where to click. There are power plants, I mean wind traps, and resource generation from spice on Arrakis maps, and free resources on faction planet maps. There is no unit cap, and building multiples of the same building doesn't increase unit production, which is unfortunate, but it makes it easier to identify how to flow with the game. Each type of building can only produce one unit at a time, meaning factories and barracks will only produce whatever you queue up one at a time. So losing units is kind of a big deal time and money rise. You can slightly combat this problem with starports, as a guild will FedEx you vehicles over a time limit. You can group units and buildings with control 1 through 9, like most RTS, and there really isn't much for you to worry about. There's world events like sandstorm, tornadoes, and sandworm attacks, and crates that can randomly spawn and give you really powerful power-ups, like units from another team or revealing the entire map. And most vehicles can run over infantry unless you're Ordos, where they're kind of limited in that. Some downsides might be that right click unselects instead of moves. Most, if not everything, is done with left click, which wasn't weird back in the day because I remember having a mouse with only one mouse button. There's no attack move like command, which means in order to get into combat, you need to directly left click enemy character models, which can resort to dudes running into them if you misclick. And the attack stance command held by holding control and left clicking makes you guys shoot at whatever location you click. So it's ineffective comparing it to just left clicking one dude and letting your dudes just go at it. Also, units with setups, usually Mortars or the Harkonnen Devastator and a few others, you have to double click the unit in a very specific spot, otherwise it won't go through, making controlling these units clunky. And no, it does not let you do it with all units, it's one at a time for each. And sometimes you could even click it on accident, which, you know, for Devastators is uh... The campaigns of this game is where most of the fun and replayability comes from. You have three different campaigns, and back in the day that required three different discs for each campaign. You can go ahead and experiment with different paths on the little For Honor map, I mean, uh, battle map. Some mission choices are blatantly harder or strange and archaic, like the Sarkona mission with the bonus objective where you're supposed to save people? I don't get it. Each faction has some common must-play story missions as well. One of them is on this cool space station mission that reminds me a lot of the StarCraft Brood War mission where you have to hack the computers with the little small squad. Says hit any key. Well, well, which one's the any key? The campaign has a lot of memorable moments on all factions, and the stronghold attacks add some replayability to each faction. Kind of like Dawn of War Dark Crusade campaign, it is a lot of fun because of the feeling of being able to make your own choices and take down a campaign map in whichever way you want. Additionally, you can have missions that allow you to ally with other sub-factions. Usually it's one or the other, but I think the Atreides might have more choices, but I haven't played their campaign in a while. Every faction also has their own bad ending, like you made too many wrong choices in a visual model. Why won't they just let us die? If you can get this working with friends, it can be a blast, and it's pretty easy with Hamachi. Especially if you enjoy the sandbox nature of the game between walls, turrets, and interesting defenses, and abusing the unlimited unit cap. The overall feel of the game is supposed to be faster paced. Matches usually don't last longer than 15 minutes, unless you're purposely trying to make them long. The game isn't too groundbreaking compared to the first game in the trilogy in my opinion, but it's a Westwood classic in its own merit, and it's on the same level as Command & Conquer 1 and Tiberian Sun to me. Like most Westwood games, the soundtrack to this game is amazing. Each major house has their own songs with their own themes and feels that fit them all aesthetically really well. The Harkonnen have this awesome industrial sounding metal, and no biases here. It's probably my favorite overall music in the game, and I think most Emperor Battle for Doom players can agree.
I mean, shit, even the installation music is epic, and of course, it's a Harkonnen song. The Atreides have, who would have guessed, heroic and honorable music, and some of the tracks are pretty memorable. Some are kind of whatever, more so than the other races, and you could tell when looking at the music for this game on YouTube playlists, Atreides seem to have not too many views compared to the other factions, but they do have good standout tracks, like Ride the Worm. The Ordos is an interesting electronic type industrial drum and bass. It's hard to explain, but it's very interesting to listen to and very fitting for their faction. Each faction has around 10 main full-length songs that you could hear while playing them, and a few others that seem to be unique to the campaign. For a 2001 game, this soundtrack blows my mind and is very memorable and good to this day. The sound design in general for this game for 2001 is pretty compelling. There is sometimes a lot going on as there's no in-between for announcer unit voice lines, but it gives me kind of a nostalgic factor when you experience all of the crazy overlaid voices. Games don't really do that anymore. 8 out of 10. This game is interesting because it's the last of a trilogy of Dune RTS created by Westwood. There was Dune 2000 in 1999 and the legendary Dune 2 in 1993. Don't ask me why it has a 2, I don't know. Which people say laid the foundation for RTS for years to come. It sucks that we may never get a true sequel of Dune RTS again due to licensing, I'm pretty sure. This was also the last RTS that Westwood created making the end of an era. The best modern representation you could get of the gameplay of this game is Command & Conquer 3, which is also an easy recommend. This game is nostalgic to me in a lot of ways, and I've enjoyed returning to it and playing it throughout the years. However, there's just a slight sadness I feel when we may never get a game like this ever again. A few things before we officially end the video. If you do manage to download the game, be sure to look up the version 1.09 patch, as it fixes a lot of problems with uh, modern machines and can let you play online a little easier. Uh, leave any questions and comments down below, and I'll answer them at the ending of next review. I know this is my first review, and things might not be as tight or understandable as I wanted. I had a hell of a time editing this, but any concerns I will be sure to attempt to fix next review. Thank you for watching, I hope you all have a wonderful week.